There were, of course, other ways of catching a glimpse of the games. Oh, it's fantastic! And, of course, the black Tickets. market flourished. Tickets. The fact that many knew how to exploit Tickets! It. Cheaper tickets! Very cheap tickets! This way! <laughs> Mounting an Olympic Games is a gigantic task. Two million people were to be transported into the area on boats, trains, and on foot. Some even disguised themselves as reindeer to get in for free. But most of them were quickly spotted and stopped in their tracks. And all of these people had to be quartered and fed. Some were lucky and found rooms in hotels. While others had to make do with simpler forms of lodging. Catering was a problem in itself. Two million mouths were to be fed, an almost impossible task for a town of Lillehammer's size, if it hadn't been for the fact that one day the town's number one cook got a brilliant idea. And with two fishes and five loaves, our Lord Jesus fed 5,000 people that day. He easily calculated that if two fish and five loaves were sufficient to feed 5,000 people, one wouldn't need any more than 800 fish and 2,000 loaves to feed two million. Naturally, that two million didn't include the IOC's representatives who were given special culinary attention. Each night, they were served a new and exotic Norwegian delicacy. Another key word was telecommunications. Every day, the games were followed by thousands of journalists from all over the world to satisfy their needs. A brand new press centre had been built, which had attracted not undue notice far beyond Norway's boundaries. The sale of souvenirs was a considerable source of income in the Olympic budget. Say, do you happen to have any more of those cute little uh, souvenir snowballs? Just a minute. Ten dollars. Whoa, hold your horses, boy. Ten bucks, that's a bit too much, isn't it? Oh, you must remember it's handmade. Oh, okay. Can you gift wrap it, please? For the Olympic competitors, it was comforting to know that a highly professional emergency medical team was on hand at all times to treat acute injuries. Here, they're trying to locate and remove an ice hockey puck that the Norwegian goalkeeper swallowed, trying to save an extremely hard slap shot from the blue line. Oh yes, here it is. But naturally, the most interesting aspect of the games was the sporting side. And the little hammeroids having only one ticket among them, showed great interest in the TV transmission. I'm afraid we have to take an X-ray. Hold on. Not everyone showed the same interest. Excuse me. 
May we have our cut, please? No! Alas, all good things come to an end, including the 17th Winter Olympic Games at Lillehammer. It all culminated on February the 27th, 1994, in an immense closing ceremony in which the theme was inspired by Norwegian culture and history. Here come 400 children from schools nationwide throwing snowballs to the spectators. An amusing little detail is that every snowball contains a genuine granite rock from a different part of Norway, which the spectator can take home as a souvenir of the Olympics here. And what's happening now? Yes, now 2,000 white peace chickens are being let loose as a symbol of... of uh, as a symbol. And here comes the world-famous Norwegian actress Liv Ullmann riding a Norwegian horse while reading from the collected works of Henrik Ibsen. And the horse's name, by the way, is Frank. And, and who is this, then? Uh, it's Norway's great son, Thor Heyerdahl, famous for the Kontiki expedition, among other exploits. Here he is, digging up final evidence that the South American Indians originally came from South America. And here is a representative from the very northern part of Norway demonstrating how tanned you can get solely by means of the midnight sun. And to top it all off, a band of Vikings dressed in exact copies of the costume the old Vikings wore. The interesting detail is that these Vikings are exactly as drunk as the old Vikings were 1,000 years ago. <laughs> and watch this. What on earth? They're, they're puking in unison, in, in complete synchronization. Absolutely fantastic. What, what superb precision. They certainly must have trained a long time to pull that one off. And let's see now. Yes, now they're leaving the arena and rushing in among the audience where, true to their Viking traditions, they're raping and pillaging selected spectators. And now, finally, the solemn moment everyone has been waiting for, the extinguishing of the Olympic flame. And suddenly it was all over. Before the Lillehammeroids had gathered their wits, the town was back in the same backwater it had occupied before the Olympic adventure started ten years previously. The only slight difference was that the 340 Lillehammeroids now had a debt of one billion dollars and a town with a room capacity of two million. The tourists were gone, unemployment was more rampant than ever, and the highway once again ran on the other side of the beautiful lake. The beautiful lake. What to do with the Olympic arenas after the games was another problem. Cheap ski jump, ski jump for sale, two for the price of one. For Mr. Hansen, it was no problem. In just ten years then, due to the Olympic fairy tale, Lillehammer was transformed from a picturesque, romantic, rustic little village into a huge, unattractive, lifeless, stony desert, saddled with a gigantic debt. But what? actually happened to the old Lillehammer, some may ask. The old Lillehammer is still lying there, just like it was in the old days. Well, that is not there exactly. It was actually purchased by an American film producer and moved to Hollywood, where it's now being used as a set for the film Snow White and the Seven Teenage Mutant Ninja Dwarfs. And action! <laughs> It's a wrap. And that concludes the rise and fall of an Olympic village. Good night. Good afternoon!